uh, first wanted to acknowledge um, the organizing um, panel, the organizing committee of this um, of this panel, uh, myself, um, Suzanne Childress of Puget Sound Regional Council, and Krishnan Viswasan of uh, Cambridge Systematics. Um, who, um, along with Elizabeth Saul from Urban Labs LLC, um, the four of us have been uh, meeting and working under the aegis of Zephyr for the past year and a half or so uh, to um, try to uh, uh, develop ways of both um, increasing the visibility of, um, of women and um, people of color in the transportation modeling industry, as well as um, increase the visibility and work of analysis of, um, of equity issues um, within the field. And um, are really thankful to Zephyr uh, for um, sponsoring this, um, this panel, which is really um, the kickoff of a number of events and discussions within this industry um, to set the agenda for both um, improving um, improving representation of um, of women and people of color in the industry, as well as um, improving and widening analysis methods um, to improve to uh, uh, to uh, improve uh, analysis and representation of equity issues um, in the industry. Um, so I'm really I'm really excited for this panel. We have a great panel coming up, who I will um, introduce in a second um just um some business some housekeeping items um one the the um panel is going to uh, the way that the session is going to work each panelist is going to speak for about 10 minutes and we'll have about five minutes after each panelist for um questions and discussion as well as question and discussion at the end um if you want to ask questions um please either um either chat in in the chat um, in the chat box, um, as well as uh, you can raise your hand. Um, I'm not sure how many questions we'll necessarily be able to accommodate. If you can, if you have uh, questions that you want to ask, um, it may be helpful as well to send me um, a private chat message um, as well. Um, we are oversubscribed for this um, session, although nobody's on the YouTube channel yet. Um, so I will make an announcement when that starts filling up that people should uh, feel free to chat questions in on the YouTube channel, at which, um, which Elizabeth or I um, will be monitoring. Um, we are um uh, you can see on the on this on the slide on the right um one um i would um, expect that everybody um both panelists and uh and people who are asking questions or discussing um will um, abide by the zephyr member code of conduct which is available on the on the zephyr website if anybody is interested and once i'm stopped once i stop talking i'll put that in the chat in the um, chat field as well um, and we are recording the session. So if you um, ask a question and, uh, and speak or put your likeness on screen, um, you are acknowledging that we may be, um, um, that we may uh, distribute it in the future. And of course, this is being live streamed to YouTube as well for the benefit of people who um, are not able to fit um, in, the, in the Zoom call, which is rapidly filling up um, and which I'm, uh, I myself am very excited about that. Um, with that, I wanted to welcome um, uh, welcome the panelists who I am going to um, briefly introduce and I'll give a more full introduction before each of them speaks. Um, we have um, Tiara Bills of Wayne State University who is going to speak on, uh, on Ring the Alarm, Case Studies of Travel Demand Analysis on Transported and Disadvantaged Communities, um, followed by Nancy McGuckin um, who is going to speak on Mainstreaming Race and Gender Analysis and Transportation Policy Research, um, followed by Brian Lee from uh, Puget Sound Regional Council. Um, who will be speaking on equity and regional planning and MPO's perspective, um, followed by Jessica Schoner of Tool Design Group, safety data gaps and their implications for racial equity. Um, and we'll be closing with Michelle Bina from Cambridge Systematics, who will be speaking on diversity in modeling. Um, with that, um, I am going to um, uh, introduce our first panelist and kick off. We now have 74 people um, 
uh, here and uh, really, um, really excited about um, about the visibility that this session is going to get. And I, um, and I think we're all going to be pleased by it. Um, I mean, to stop sharing the opening slide, uh, Tira, if you want to share your screen while I introduce you. Uh, Dr. Tira Bills is an assistant professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Wayne State University. She recently joined Wayne State in summer 2019 after spending three years as a Michigan Society Fellow and an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. Prior to her fellowship at University of Michigan, Dr. Bills worked as a research scientist at IBM Research Africa for three years in Nairobi. Much of Dr. Bills' current research focuses on investigating the social impacts of transportation projects. She develops activity-based travel demand models to investigate individual and household level transportation equity effects for the purpose of designing transportation systems that will provide more equitable returns to society. Her latest project aims to understand the potential for next generation transit systems to affect transportation equity outcomes. Her general areas of interest include transportation equity analyses, emerging data sources for travel demand modeling, and transit design and reliability. Dr. Bills holds a BS in Civil Engineering Technology from Florida A&M University, an MS and PhD degrees in Transportation Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Bills. Hello, can you hear me? Can hear you. Okay. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, my presentation is going to cover uh, two studies that I've been working on um, in partnership with some faculty at University of Michigan, as well as research uh, with, a re with a research team at Ford Motor Company, um, both of which I hope will frame or help to frame uh, this panel's um, discussion on vulnerable groups uh, in transportation and travel demand modeling. Um, although we only have uh, 10 minutes per presentation and I won't um, have so much time to dive into all of the results, I really hope to leave you with um, some new questions um, that uh, will help us to better understand, well, for some of you, new questions and for others, um, a better understanding of why these questions are important. So, next. So, uh, my research makes use of travel demand analysis in order to understand uh, the equity ramifications of our transportation decisions um, and with specific emphasis on, um, on income groups, on um, elderly on um, uh, just various groups, those who have, might have disadvantages. And in fact, my dissertation work was on how to make use of activity-based models to come up with measures that would represent um, equity outcomes. Um, however, uh, what I have learned since that time is that, um, you know, one, representative, representativeness and, um, or excuse me, one of the things that I was, was grappling with at the time of my dissertation was the importance of representativeness. And, you know, we have these measures that sort of, you know, they depend on having data available. They depend on having models and measures available. And, you know, gosh, I thought that my, you know, um, only real challenge was to see how to use these things to, um, to understand equity. The reality is that those, those results um, uh, are very much dependent on the quality of data um, and how, you know, how reflective those data are um, of true distinctions and disparities uh, in the data. Uh, I apologize for the loud noises in the background. Um, and so in that time, I've really been questioning, um, you know, not just how representative our measures are and not just how representative our data is, but looking at representation really throughout the whole modeling process that begins with data collection that, um, that is involved with data cleaning and expansion. Um, we use those data to build, um, estimate, and use those models to predict travel behavior outcomes, and then we use those outcomes to, to 
perform analyses and, and make decisions, um, we really should be questioning the level of representation throughout our full process. And so um, the, the two case studies that I'm going to highlight um, really focus on data collection um, and uh, offers some, some thoughtful questions on how representative our model structures are. So this first, um, excuse me, this first case study that I'm going to highlight um, is, sorry, I'm trying to toggle my notes and toggle the presentation at the same time. This first study is focused in Benton Harbor, uh, Michigan, which is a small, small city off the western coast of Michigan. Um, and our objectives for this project were to um, were to survey the trend um, the operator uh, the transit operator in Benton Harbor was interested in um, our recommendations on what types of transit improvements would help to target accessibility um, in terms of access to employment, access to education, um, healthcare, and also grocery store locations. Are you all still with me? Okay. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, we were challenged. Sorry? We're still with you. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we were challenged with, um, you know, going into the community and um, collecting these data from hard to reach groups. Uh, we partnered with um, the transit operator Dollar Ride as well as the career services provider for the region, Connexus. And uh, we really wanted to offer a mixture of survey modes um, because from a research perspective, we also wanted to be able to understand um, how effective these different modes are in attracting um, uh, these different groups. Um, and so we offered, in addition to a paper survey, we offered an online survey and uh, they, they could take the survey via smartphone. And um, although I won't focus on it in this discussion, we also offered some passive data collection options, including um, a wearable GPS tracker and uh, uh, smartphone application, so GPS tracking via smartphone application. And one of the center points of this data collection effort was to offer um, these survey data collection modes along with in-person workshops. And so we offered a series of workshop, workshops where I, myself, and my team went into Benton Harbor um, at Connexus. We invited community members out um, to hear a brief presentation about our survey and what was important, what we were trying to do. And also they had the opportunity to take the survey then and there. Um, and, and so that, it turns out that was a really important part of our data collection effort. Um, the, so, so with this, with this, um, with this effort, we, we did a, range of things, including uh, distributing flyers to directly to Connexus clients, so people who were using the career services um, looking for work. We posted flyers in the Dollar Ride shuttles. We posted um, uh, ads in local newspapers. We circulated press releases. We made announcements on the local radio station. Um, we also made Facebook groups. And so we did a range of things um, to, to get people out to these uh, workshops, as well as to encourage them to take the survey online. One of the um, one of the first insights that I want to highlight um, with respect to the data um, is that even when we look at our data set in comparison to the conventional data set which was collected by the Michigan Department of Transportation back in 2010, um, if we isolate from the MDOT survey um, the transport dis, excuse me, the transport disadvantaged groups, low income um, transit, uh, sorry, low, low income uh, individuals. 
we still see some significant differences when we compare the transport disadvantage group from uh, the conventional survey versus our survey that we collected. Um, and uh, these are things like if we look at the number of individuals driving alone, we see um, in our survey, we have a share of 44% versus 66% in the MDOT survey. Um, we also have uh, many more transit users in our survey, 26% um, versus 8% in MDOT survey. And again, this is us um, looking at the demographics in our data um, and isolating the segment of Benton Harbor um, uh, tra travelers from the MDOT survey and trying to make a comparison. And even with um, holding those demographics um, fairly constant, we still see uh, some differences in, um, in their travel behavior, okay? Uh, the second insight that I want to highlight is that the combination of the paper surveys and our targeted uh, outreach activities um, seem to really matter. Um, the participants who came out to the workshops and took the paper survey, um, and I want to point out that also, also, although they took, most people took the paper survey, they had an option, as you can see in the image, they had an option to take the survey via um, uh, the online version. Um, so we're looking at people who came into the workshop and took the uh, survey via paper. Um, we see some clear distinctions in the, the, the basic travel behavior. So for individuals who took the paper survey, they're much more likely to um, uh, use transit and much less likely to, to drive alone. Okay. Uh, and um, I also want to point out that individuals who were coming out to the workshop as opposed to staying home and taking the survey online, they were also more likely to be elderly um, and to have some type of disability. So um, this is an ongoing project and uh, we're currently using um, our data set in conjunction with uh, the MDOT survey. So we're using our data as a, um, as a supplement. Um, we're using these data sets jointly to build um, a series of mode and destination choice models um, uh, in order for us to address the, the original concerns of what types of alternatives would, would help to improve accessibility. Um, and we're also going through the process of, of, of investigating more complex travel behaviors, things like trip chaining and looking at um, low, access, low access locations in the, in the area. Um, but the questions that we are um, expecting to, to investigate are the following. Um, one, what are uh, the sample strategies or what sample strategies lead to more representative data sets um, is, is one of the questions that we're hoping to get at. Um, second, how effective are uh, conventional data expansion methods in addressing uh, underrepresentativeness? And then finally, um, what is the nature of model prediction distortions that can result from underrepresentativeness? I think these are uh, three important questions for us. And then a broader question uh, that I want to sort of put forward is just how far off the mark are we? And um, how might transportation decisions change uh, with um, the uh, advent of more representative data? Okay. So the next case study um, uh, is focusing on looking at a regional microtransit service in the city of Detroit, well, the, the region of Detroit, excuse me. And this is a uh, project that is in partnership with the Mor Ford Motor Company. They are interested in understanding how they might support uh, transit options, in particular microtransit options, um, that would support uh, accessibility for, um, for households in the Detroit region who are in the greatest need. Um, so what we did with this project was to make use of an existing regional travel demand model, four-step model that's um, maintained by the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, the MPO in the region. Um, and we, uh, we, we engaged this model in order to uh, estimate um, accessibility measures and to look at how those accessibility measures um, would change due to an, a new microtransit alternative 
and in addition, how uh, those gains would be distributed across different groups, in particular low income and auto ownership groups. <clears throat> and um, we, we, we engaged in, uh, I think, what is a familiar process to uh, most of us here um, in the process of building a new uh, microtransit alternative um, using this existing model. So we simply introduce uh, microtransit into, um, into the, the choice set. And, um, uh, you know, without really going further to talk about what our results were, I want to put forth this critical question um, that we were grappling with, which is when forecasting um, impacts or equity impacts of a new transit option, um, you know, one question that is important to answer is whether the model structure is appropriate for all of the groups that we are, um, that we are focusing on. Um, it occurs to us that for some groups, it might make more sense um, or be most appropriate for a new microtransit option to fall um, with the transit modes. If we're talking about a nested logit, which we have in our case, um, for others, it might uh, be most appropriate for it to fall in another nest in, in auto modes. This is going to, to depend on the group and their experiences and their, their frame of reference. Um, and so, you know, the reason why we grapple with this is because the, the ramifications of this are really unknown um, uh, to us. If we, um, if we misspecify um, and proceed with our equity analysis, you know, what is the cost of that misspecification? Uh, so, um, so really, I, I'll, I'll just stop there. Um, I think that this is a, a case where, um, you know, where it's, it's sort of very clear that these are important questions to be asking. Okay. Um, so to summarize and, um, and sort of, you know, keep the conversation going, um, with respect to electronic data, um, I know that making use of passive um, electronic data um, big data um, is sort of the next wave or is probably a current and safe to say it's a current wave in our uh, community. Um, I just want to put forth that uh, it's very likely that rather than completely doing away with traditional sort of paper and active um, engagement activities, rather than doing away with those, it's most likely that the most representative results will result from some fusion um, of, of techniques and we really need to see more focus in, in this area. Um, with regard to demand models, um, particularly in the case where we are focusing on equity, um, we need to consider um, that one model structure may not fit all. Um, and then finally, to keep the discussion going, I think that um, we need to be thinking about uh, how we, um, you know, how we are teaching um, travel demand analysis methods in our courses. And, um, you know, what I'm learning is that we do need to see more emphasis on model checking for the purpose of understanding how representative our models and data sets are. Um, also, um, what are the real consequences of poor data quality of upper underrepresented data? Um, and what are the, the cost of, of model misspecifications? So with that, I'll pass the baton to the next panelist. Um, thank you, doc, um, Dr. Bills. Um, I have one question coming in um, asking um, if uh, you um, wanted to briefly discuss the trade-off um, between disaggregate data and um, high resolution data and privacy for, um, um, for vulnerable communities and how do you decide um, what a sufficient amount of data to collect is and if there are um, uh, trade-offs um, that you see in terms of privacy for, um, uh, for, um, for disadvantaged communities. You're muted. You are muted. Hi, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I think I quickly muted myself because there's so much background noise. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a mouthful. And, you know, one of the things that I could say 
um, from our investigation is that we we do seem to have more um, uh, people who are not responding to certain questions um, in the data set. For example, if I turn back to my slide on mode choice for individuals who came into our workshops, um, they have the highest under response for the question of mode. What mode are you taking? We had um, about 20% of people who came in who just didn't answer the question. Um, and that's in comparison to a fairly small number, about 4% in the, in the broader survey. Um, so, you know, based on that, I would say that um, you know, we certainly need to be trying to compensate for the fact that, you know, even though we got people to come out to a survey and participate to an extent, they're still going to be hesitant to respond to certain um, questions. Um, I mean, that's really all I could say. I really have to think more about, you know, what the, what the additional trade-offs are. I think that, um, you know, with this, we're sort of revealing that there, there are, you know, there are needs to, um, there is a need to, you know, to, to, to vary the sample size by, um, you know, by community, but I, you know, I couldn't really say uh, more than that at this point. I'd have to think a little more about it, but I mean, that's a really interesting question, so I thank you for that. Thank you. Um, we're going to move along now. Um, our second speaker is Nancy McGuckin. Um, Nancy McGuckin mines large public data sets to develop insightful perspectives to be used in transportation plans and policies at federal, state, and local levels. She focuses in the intersection of demographics and socioeconomic trends, including new technologies, which all have significant and sometimes surprising effects on travel behavior, informative briefs, papers, and presentations. Nancy. Thank you. Um, everything good? You can see me and hear me? Yes. Okay, I did want to say Tira's uh, thing was so very critically important and in one of the planning meetings for this uh, presentation group, we, I was talking about how my experience in the 1980s and the 1990s in doing a lot of metropolitan travel surveys, um, I started seeing that, you know, it was like the engaged, the trusting government, um, the uh, people in the suburbs who were willing to take these very complex uh, data, you know, surveys about their travel, keep a travel diary uh, for a day. And they trusted and understood that this was going to be used in transportation planning. And so as a result, all of these, the demand was shown to be in these suburban areas where predominantly white people lived. And all that demand was answered with strong, you know, um, infrastructure development and you know, a lot of attention in the transportation planning process. And I saw how that under, that the people who are underrepresented in the surveys got left out of the whole process. And I think what Tierra is talking about is so, so critically important. Um, I just wanted to say those few words before I start on what my uh, talk is today is the gender mainstreaming. Um, in transportation policy research. So uh, when we analyze our travel behavior data by race and gender, we put people at the center of our planning and policy making. It moves these issues into the mainstream of our discussions and it re often reveals some of the hidden assumptions and values that we bring to policy making in particular. Um, gender uh, mainstreaming and in this, uh, I guess, race mainstreaming, talking about race and ethnicity as well. The goal is to encourage these critical analyses of our norms and assumptions in all areas of our work. But since I'm a data nut, and I'm guessing a lot of people in the audience are too, I'm going to focus on data analysis and tools. Um, the it, it, in terms of travel behavior, there are critical points of gender differences. The price elasticities, the, the ability and constraints, security concerns and safety, all of these areas are critical, tr tr show critical differences in travel behavior. Um, 
I learned at TRB uh, 2020, which seems like years ago, but I learned that there still is not an adult female crash test dummy. Even though women are more vulnerable in car crashes, um, they're still using a 75th percentile male crash test dummy. It's unbelievable. Uh, we know a lot about the differences in travel behavior between men and women. Uh, women are more likely to live in households with children. Uh, working women in those households make more person trips than comparable men. Uh, the trips are more likely to be related to household maintenance. And uh, women are more likely to drive high occupancy vehicles. Um, we also know that the nature of work is changing. And I think the COVID uh, stay at home orders has really, really brought that to the forefront. Um, we understand that there are huge differences between men's and women's uh, ability to work. Men are more likely to have flex time um, and have the option to telecommute. Um, working women are more likely to have multiple part-time jobs and to do gig work. Um, men are more likely to work at home, which we are all more likely to do now. Uh, even more pronounced when you look at that by uh, you look at the changes in the workforce are, that are correlated with race and ethnicity, uh, whites overall are more likely to work at home or have the option to telecommute. Um, Krishnan shared a very interesting uh, data visualization with me that we looked at in the LA larger region about who was still traveling after the stay at home orders. And they were predominantly people living in areas that were uh, concentrated with minority populations. Um, they are our essential workers. So um, women and men use the new options available at different rates. They um, employed moms are less than half as likely to use rideshare compared to um, singles. And employed women are much more likely to order online for home delivery. And finally, as, as women age, they're more likely to report a travel disability than same aged men. Um, and they're more likely to change their travel and, uh, as a result or curtail their travel as a result. So um, women and men overall have different constraints, concerns, they have different attitudes, they have different ha habits and opportunities. And travel behavior data that uses the gender, it's available, we obtain gender, but there is a certain reluctance to use gender for some reason, people wanna use employment status and presence of children and other things rather than gender, even though they're so highly correlated. And we need, to, we need to include more analysis with gender along with those caretaking activities, especially as we see more intersection with race and gender and ethnicity and gender. There are some big differences that need to be understood and included. So governments invest a lot of time and resources into their transportation infrastructure. And we used to think that networks were, they were just gender neutral and that if you built it well, it would benefit everybody equally. But now we recognize that men and women have different travel needs and have different constraints and are affected differently by transportation interventions. And so the, uh, the gender mainstreaming is to include gender in our data analysis, in our policy development, in our management, in our institutions, and in our impact analysis, specifically looking at gender. So the gender equality means that transport systems should be an instrument for the men and women to live equally, and it should facilitate men and women's daily lives, increasing their possibilities of working and studying, and I like this, participating in inspirational leisure activities. So thank you very much for including me in this discussion. And that's it for me. Thank you, Nancy. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how um, your personal experience um, and your personal life experience has um, 
shaped your views about uh, the importance of um, including gender in, uh, in mainstreaming gender? Yeah, you know, we talked about this a little bit also in one of the planning meetings is, is that, you know, when I was a young researcher, um, I understood that most of the normative behavior we were talking about and was this com the traditional commute to work. It was the work trip that started in the suburbs for a nine to five, five day a week, uh, likely male commuter. And our, our entire system has taken this peak period work trip as um, the, the focus of a lot of our planning. It defines transit <laughs> um, accessibility and design. It, des it defines you know, um, more, a lot of urban area design. And it was, it was in the 90s when I first had children when I realized that um, there, was, there was a missing perspective. And the perspective that I brought to it was this trip chaining perspective that women were less likely to leave home and go directly to work or leave work and go directly to home than men were. And that they, they even when they had flex time and other opportunities, they would use that time to do all of the errands and all of the household maintenance travel that they, uh, that they did when they were married with children and also working. They, they dropped children at daycare or school. They'd stop and get groceries on the way home or something for dinner. And that their work trip was not being represented, re represented correctly um, in the modeling that was looking at home-based work. Um, so that was the perspective I, I brought in. And then I think this diversity of the workforce is so important because we all bring our own perspectives. And I think we all have blind blinders in a way, blind spots as it were. And we all have different points of view. And I think working together, we get a more inclusive and diverse um, forecast and understanding of travel behavior. Jonathan, you're muted. That's me this time. Um, just a reminder to everyone that if you have questions, please uh, either put them in the chat box to everyone, or if you want me to ask the questions, um, send me a private message. Um, we're gonna move on at this point, um, and uh, Nancy will also continue to monitor um, the chat as well if you have questions about her presentation. Um, now we're going to move on to um, Brian Lee. Brian, can you uh, please share your presentation um, while I introduce you? Um, Brian is a principal planner at the data department at the Puget Sound Regional Council, the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Four County Seattle region. He helps lead the data applications group, which connects modelers and analysts to planners and policymakers. He translates data results into easy to understand and usable information and extracts technical requirements from planning discussions and policy questions. In addition to co-managing the household travel survey program, Brian is the PSRC lead in developing tools and data products to help address equity in various work programs, including growth management and long range transportation planning. Brian. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, thank you. Yes. So I'm going to take us a little bit out of the weeds uh, and provide a little bit of a broader perspective on the decision making. And I'm going to start by talking about equity in the regional uh, planning context, um, what equity has often meant for metropolitan planning organizations, and then focus on some data and modeling related examples from. Uh, the Puget Sound Regional Council. Um, okay, let me... Hey, there we go. So metropolitan planning organizations come in a variety of sizes and forms and can do many different things. The Puget Sound Regional Council, the MPO for the Central Puget Sound region around Seattle is just one example. We provide three regional functions growth management, transportation planning, and economic development. But at the heart of all NPOs is the role of a regional convener, getting a variety of jurisdictions, big and small, to the same table. And at these tables, one of the functions common to all NPOs are the coordination of long-range transportation planning and funding of upcoming transportation projects. Equity is not a new concept for NPOs, but the dimension of equity with which all NPOs have a history of familiarity is primarily from a geographic perspective. 
one of the core functions of an NPO is the development of a transportation improvement program or TIP, a fiscally constrained process that helps translate ideas, concepts from the long range transportation plan into reality. So in such a competitive environment for scarce resources often leads to the question of where funds are going, as in which jurisdiction is getting what. Until relatively recently, social equity dimensions such as race and gender, particularly with respect to data and modeling, were not commonly considered in explicit ways in regional planning. But that doesn't mean that they're not connected to the geographic perspective that is often at the center of MBO, MPO discussions and negotiations. So for example, many cities and regions are still relatively segregated by race. This is largely due to the historical legacies of things like redlining, mortgage discrimination, restrictive covenants, and other discriminatory government policies and commercial practices that were geographic based. Some seemingly neutral policies, uh, such as exclusionary zoning and other more overt ones, such as the routing and construction of freeways through communities of color, we're at best maintaining racial gaps and at worst widening the disparities. So these connections between race, geography, and transportation are perpetuated when those involved, MPO included, don't explicitly consider who will derive benefits and who will shoulder the burdens of billions and billions of dollars of transportation investment. So this shift from primarily thinking about where to also considering who is one of the main principles in the PSRC equity work program and it help drives the data and modeling work that we do. In the rest of the presentation, I'll show some examples of that work. So the first couple of examples are simply figuring out and showing where disadvantaged populations live. The animation that was just on this map reveals tremendous growth in people of color in our region in the last couple of decades. This type of map provides valuable context based on who lives where. The second animation reveals the increasing prevalence of low income populations and the change in the, straight, uh, the spatial distribution. So having that understanding of where we're coming from leads to a lot of different policy and planning questions. When PSRC embarked on the process of updating our long range growth management plan or vision 2050, we struggled with how to incorporate social equity dimensions in our forecasting work. We have a relatively sophisticated modeling system comprised of an activity based travel model called Soundcast and a parcel level application of the urban sim land use model. But neither models can forecast the distribution of people and activities in space by qualities such as race and income for planned production purposes. And as a stepping stone, we decided to create these equity geographies to highlight areas of the region where there are high concentrations of disadvantaged populations. We then used these geographies to summarize data analyses and modeling results to help evaluate planning alternatives. So for example, this chart here shows four growth alternatives for 2050, our planning horizon. The purple and green bars show the amount of expected population growth for each alternative for the low income and people of color geographies respectively. The differences among the two sets of bars highlights the varying amount of development pressures and housing needs between the alternatives. In this example, the chart, uh, we uh, summarize the number of people and jobs that will be close to high capacity transit by the four growth alternatives. So the light green bars show the numbers for the people of color equity geographies. The darker green bars show them for the remaining areas, and the gray bars show the regional proportions. We summarize modeling results for a variety of performance measures in this fashion, and they supported complex and in-depth uh, discussions by the decision makers for more equitable distributions 
of benefits and mitigations for these impacts. Besides modeling, we have a few other items in our equity uh, toolbox. This one is the opportunity mapping, which is based on an index of measures of neighborhood opportunity and positive life outcomes. There are five broad categories of indicators and the results highlight the spatial distribution of access to opportunities in our region. When we overlay alternatives for our regional plans, we can have discussions about where investments are proposed and what gaps are being filled or not. This tool is part of the project selection criteria in our uh, transportation improvement program. This next one is another mapping tool and it identifies areas at greater risk of displacement based on our current neighborhood conditions. Its index also includes five categories of indicators and it helps highlight places where people are at risk to be displaced for economic, physical, and community reasons. And lastly, um, it would be a disservice to not mention our uh, travel survey. Uh, this is bread and butter for a lot of regions. Uh, there is our household uh, travel survey program, which is increasingly being used to support both the models and provide information on the latest trends. So like a few other regions, we recently transitioned from doing a large survey every eight to 10 years to our current program of doing smaller surveys every two years. We're experimenting with doing multi-year weighting of the survey responses like the American Community Survey where multiple years are combined to increase the sample sizes and statistical robustness. We're also able to make uh, minor changes to the survey to respond to changing needs. So in our latest one, the 2019 survey, we added a question for households uh, about, um, for households that moved within the last five years on factors for their relocation. So these two charts show the responses and uh, comparing people of color to non-Hispanic white. Uh, this allowed us to gather some unique data on why people move and dived into the questions of who is being displaced and from where. Um, lastly, I'm kind of ending on this one slide, uh, kind of pulling back out into the equity work program. Um, the, the way that we're kind of shifting from the where question to a where and who question allows us to better define uh, equity based on people, uh, kind of echoing uh, some of the sentiments that Nancy mentioned in the beginning of her chat. Um, we want to have a common understanding among our members and center equity in all of our plans. As far as data and modeling tools are concerned, there's upcoming work that we're going to be doing on building some equity data dashboard, indicators of various types of outcomes that are relevant to the conversations. We're interested in providing a variety of uh, performance uh, measure improvements to our modeling and other types of analytical uh, uh, capabilities. And then finally, uh, one of the things that's on our uh, topic of discussion is providing data support beyond our membership, potentially providing data support for organizations that are advancing uh, various dimensions of social equity. So that is the uh, end of my presentation. And Jonathan, back to you. Thank you, Brian. Um, so, a question for you, Brian, is to what extent do you see the work of analysts as leading this shift or the work of policymakers and, um, and for the lagging um, body, what do you think the response has been? How does, how are you, how are, how is this work moved forward in the Seattle region? I think it's a little bit of both. There's a lot of back and forth. Uh, decision makers have a lot of interest in a variety of different areas. They have their constituents to worry about. Um, I think as data analysts, as modelers, it's our job to make the recommendations of certain tools to use. There's not necessarily the technical perspective, even though the Seattle region, for example, has very data savvy uh, politicians and decision makers. And yet um, it's kind of up to us to kind of bring in some of the latest capabilities and allow a conversation that's empirically based. Uh, there's a lot of discussions, a lot of interest in a variety of area where we're not necessarily providing that support. And I think 
we're hearing those and we're kind of bringing it back to see how we can solve those. But you can't just bring a gamut of things uh, to the table without creating a lot of confusion and a lot of unnecessary complexity. A lot of the things that we dive into, uh, some of the modeling work that um, Tierra mentioned at the very beginning, um, they're just very difficult to explain when you have a board that meets once a month for an hour and a half and you're allocated maybe 20 minutes to it. And within that 20 minutes, you have to spend one minute to explain what the error term in your multinomial logic model means. That's just not going to happen, right? So I think we have to be very practical about who our audiences are and how do we bring this to a level that is clear and understandable for these really important decisions. So I, I sometimes see there's a disconnect there and I think those of us working in this field have to be part of that bridge. Ryan, do you think um, that you had the training in your education, your early career to, um, um, to work with some of those issues or do you think that there is, that the training that um, forecasters and modelers receive is sufficient um, or are there areas that you think could be improved? Um, so I came from a civil engineering background from my undergrad and my master's, and then I went to planning. So I think I got a certain perspective uh, that might be different than some other people. Although I see many programs where the focus on the technical aspect is being uh, married with uh, and complemented with a lot of kind of practical and um, useful uh, planning skills. So I think for those that are very, very technical, you got to ask the question of like those great things that you're doing on the computer, who's going to use it and who's going to understand it. And at the same time, those that are coming up with the planning and policy questions, as we become more data dependent, there's a need for uh, the, the, the policy and planners to uh, have certain technical expertise to allow the exchange of ideas. And so uh, I think the, the venues like these, I see the list of participants, I recognize a lot of names from different areas. I think it's great that we're talking about a very complex set of subjects like race and gender in both a technical, accessible, and planning kind of way that uh, brings together all these different components. Thank you. Um... We're going to move on to our next um, next panelist. Um, just a reminder, we've got a great discussion happening in the chat box now. I'd encourage both uh, panelists to answer questions as they come in and to continue asking um, great questions. And we're going to keep on keeping track of those. Um, next speaker is going to be uh, Jessica Schoner. Um, as a senior researcher at Tool Design, uh, Jessica Schoner works at the Nexus of Transportation Planning and Data Science. She uses GIS and statistics to help public agencies answer critical questions about the effects of infrastructure in the built environment on travel behavior, physical activity, health, and safety outcomes. She earned her PhD and MS in civil engineering and a master's in urban and regional planning from the University of Minnesota. Jessica. Thanks, Jonathan, and I'm so excited to be here and uh, be part of this really awesome conversation. I'm going to take us back into the weeds um, and also uh, slightly to the periphery of, of travel modeling. My work is um, more in the safety area, and there are certainly a lot of overlaps. They're related in a lot of ways. The demand that you forecast definitely influences how how we design our roads, which then influences what our safety outcomes are for people walking and biking along them. So I hope this is relevant and useful to you. Um, so I'm going to start by, I guess, telling a story about some work that I'm in the middle of right now that really highlights some of these um, issues we see in terms of discriminatory outcomes in traffic safety, um, just, you know, really in the weeds, uh, just a, a pretty good example of like all the different issues we, we encounter. Um, and then I'll try to zoom out a little bit and talk about what we know and, and where we need to move forward. Um, I'm working on a team of people on, uh, with a team of people on a women's transportation needs assessment for the LA Department of Transportation. This was inspired by that brilliant understanding how women travel study that LA Metro did a year or two ago. Um, 
And my role in this project was analyzing existing conditions for the neighborhoods in our study. We selected three different neighborhoods using kind of a sociological study framework. They were chosen for their differences on race, income, geography, um, both where they are in the region as well as how transit accessible they were. So uh, contrasting three completely disparate areas. Um, our study neighborhoods were Sawtell, um, kind of on the, the western part of the city near the coast, Sun Valley, which is up in the valley, if you're familiar with the LA area, and Watts, which is um, South LA along the Blue Line. And um, these neighborhoods are pretty different. They were selected, as I said, for their differences in geography, race, and income. Um, Watts is uh, has a much larger share of black residents, lower average incomes, um, longer average commute times. Like it, it, it's there are a lot of different indicators that suggest it's a, um, a pretty marginalized community uh, with a lot of disadvantages. And then Sun Valley has. Um, you know, still lower incomes, a little less transit accessibility, but a uh, different racial makeup. Sawtell is a bit um, more middle income and quite a bit wider. Um, so we looked at these neighborhoods on a number of land use and infrastructure dimensions. And I've got a few up on screen here. I'll talk about the, the highlights. Um, we had a pretty limited set of data, but we looked at things like um, intersection density in the neighborhoods and then um, the uh, how many signalized intersections there were. And we were able to look at like a, a ratio of um, signals to intersections to, to get a sense of, of how, um, how many intersections are traffic controlled so someone could cross easily. Um, and we looked at uh, street lights or roadway lighting, um, walkability index, a bunch of different dimensions. We saw this picture of Watts as um, uh, um, a place that like maybe was designed for people to move through as quickly as possible. Um, the intersections are less likely to be signalized, and I didn't have ADT data to confirm whether that's because it's just a quiet neighborhood with no major streets, but I don't think that's the case. Um, the, the neighborhood allegedly has more street lighting than other neighborhoods in the city, but we heard from community feedback that they're not really operational, um, and so lighting is still pretty poor. Um, despite it being a fairly dense transit accessible area, the walkability index, which is a composite ind index of a bunch of different land use indicators, was pretty low. Um, the, the transit stations were less likely to have amenities like shelters or benches. Um, so just kind of a, a disadvantaged neighborhood in contrast with these others. Um, and. I'm, I'm dwelling on this because then we, when we look at the safety outcomes, we saw um, a convergence of these, on the one hand, infrastructure and land use or deprivation indicators and safety outcomes. And um, it's just, it's a little unusual to see that striking of a uh, um, confirmation between two different aspects of the study. So we found in um, Watts that the, the rate of fatal and serious injury crashes was um, among women and among children was about double in our other study neighborhoods and, and in the rest of the um, the rest of the city and you can see from this map um, a lot of severe traffic outcomes among children are happening in neighborhoods where most of the residents are people of color um, this really shouldn't surprise anyone. We, we kind of know this from the rest of our, our safety work, but um, it was just, it was very striking to see that this is happening and, and these are children being killed or seriously injured in traffic crashes. Um, we're really in the weeds here, but um, it's, it really struck out to me is because it, as I said, we saw in the, the infrastructure metrics that it, it looked like this neighborhood was set up to move cars through as quickly and efficiently as possible. And then when we we're planning for this panel, I, I saw this quote here in the abstract and it just brought everything into focus for me that, that maybe that's what we've been doing. Um, it, um, 
yeah, it's, um, it was just, it, it had a big impact. So zooming back out, um, I can kind of summarize the issues we see in safety analysis um, in a few different dimensions. First, we know from a lot of the data that black people and other people of color are disproportionately affected by traffic violence. They're more likely to be killed or seriously injured while walking, um, more likely to be in a crash, they're uh, more likely to live in a neighborhood without sidewalks. Um, we know that these, these outcomes are, are um, biased by race. We also know that the data that we use to analyze safety is also biased. Um, we know from research that um, crashes where the victim is black, indigenous, or person of color are less likely to be reported to police, and so they're underrepresented in our data. Um, so we're not getting a full picture. Um, so despite this underreporting, we still know that there's a problem. So whatever disparities we see, we can assume they're probably worse. Um, and then our field has relied on enforcement as a strategy for traffic safety. We also know, uh, especially recently, that there are racial disparities in policing outcomes that make traffic enforcement, which you might turn to to um, mitigate some of these safety problems we see in neighborhoods of color, and instead that could be making it worse. So um, kind of a, a hairy problem. So I've got a few slides with some supporting evidence for this. We know, um, as I said, that um, traffic violence is has a disproportionate impact on people of color. Um, we see this in all the different metrics. Um, children who are killed while walking, the land use characteristics in neighborhoods that make them safer or, or less safe. Um, here is that same heat map of child severe crashes in Los Angeles overlaid with a redlining map. You can see this, is, this isn't new. Um, as Brian was discussing in um, with Seattle, like a, a lot of cities are still um, dealing with this legacy of segregation that's informing our, our traffic outcomes today. Um, and lest anyone think I'm picking on LA, that just happens to be a project I've been working on a lot recently. We, we see this everywhere we look at safety and everywhere we, we overlay a safety analysis with demographics. In Denver's Vision Zero Action Plan, we saw that communities of concern are overrepresented on their high injury network. Um, we saw the same thing in Minneapolis's Vision Zero analysis. Again, that these high injury streets are disproportionately falling within, um, within areas of concentrated poverty and communities of color. And as I mentioned, these um, the crash data that we use to build these analyses are subject to underreporting that systematically skews toward underrepresentation of Black people. So, however bad this this looks right now, it's it's probably worse. Um, and as I noted, that racial disparities in policing make traffic enforcement probably pro pretty problematic. I, I don't think we need. You know, we're, we're all aware of, of, of these issues. Um, but that, that leaves us with some problems because um, the analysis methods that we use are looking at crash history. We know that um, crash history is, is biased. So or the records of crash history are biased so that we might be missing areas or de-emphasizing neighborhoods of color uh, less than they deserve for how big of a burden the safety problems are. Um, and what can we do about that? So um, I don't have all the answers. Um, so I've thrown out a few ideas here, some that we're already working on and some that we need to do better on. Um, start with what's, what's going well so far. Um, there are methods we can use that don't rely on crash history alone, that don't re rely exclusively on these police records. And there are lots of ways that we can work on safety that don't rely on enforcement. Um, the systemic and that systemic safety framework, or, or um, often referred to as Vision Zero, is, is a pretty good example of this. We can um, identify common risk factors and screen the network and find every location that has all these combinations of infrastructure features that are associated with crash risk and proactively fix them, whether there are uh, 
crashes that have been reported there or not. And so this way we, we don't necessarily penalize a neighborhood because its residents don't trust the police and can't report crashes to them. So we, we've done some sophisticated statistical work in this area um, for city of Seattle. Um, and this was using uh, safety performance functions and complex statistical modeling. It can also be done fairly straightforward using cross tabs, looking at well-known risk factors, um, just in a, a much simpler way. We're working with um, City of Cincinnati for their Vision Zero for Youth and it, screening the network on how high the ADT is, how high the speeds are, how many lanes there are. And that catches most um, youth fatal and serious injury crashes. But again, we're relying on the network screening rather than the crash history. So we're not penalizing a neighborhood for underreporting of crashes. Um, this is way outside my field of expertise, but there are definitely non-enforcement solutions for traffic safety. I'll skip through that. And then the areas where we really need to get better is how we prioritize community safety needs based on nuanced travel patterns, based on um, a more rigorous analysis of who is being impacted. Um, you know, when we do prioritization, a lot of times we pull together all sorts of dis disparate indicators, percent of residents who are people of color, percent of residents or households with zero vehicles, um, throw in children and seniors, and you end up with this amalgam that you can't really see anymore what you're valuing. So we can work on making that clearer. We can also work on getting better data. Um, you know, we could fix or replace the entire crash reporting process and community uh, problems with policing. I guess probably goes way beyond our feet. So in the interim, um, looking at disaggregate demographics and historical data like those red lighting maps can help and collecting and using qualitative data better. This is something that we struggle with. Um, for example, in, in our analysis that I mentioned earlier where we saw that Watts has more street lights than average, but the community members are telling us, well, no, they're not turned on all the way, they don't work that needs to filter into our analyses as well. So that's where I'm at. If anyone has any good ideas, I'd love to hear them. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jessica. Um, just doing a quick time check. We're right on time. Um, I'm wondering um, what, your, what your perspective would be if you were to find e either um, either through modeling or through observation that the, one of the most critical um, attributes of an area that is of high, high crash risk was simply being in a black neighborhood. Um, what's the response? To, what, what do you do with that information um, practically? Well, um... As a, as a data person, my instinct is to say, study it more or go fix it. But I know those are both wrong. Um, you should probably start by actually talking to the community. There's a long history of things being done to black neighborhoods rather than investments being made with black communities. So um, if that is the single biggest predictor of severe crash outcomes, that tells me that maybe we need to get our heads out of the data and just go start doing the work, building relationships and um, investing in streets that don't kill people. Thank you. Um, any other, um, any questions, any questions for Jessica on, um, uh, on the, um, on the chat? Um, if, um, um, if there are any, please, um, uh, please continue. Actually, I have one, um, that came up from, uh, um, that's more general, but I'll ask it now to you and then I'll ask it again later is, um, what do you think contributes to successful storytelling, um, with, um, from the data with respect to race and gender, um, what are the most compelling ways um, that you've seen in telling this type of story? 
this is something I struggle with actually, um, because again, it's, it's easy to get stuck in the numbers. And so one of the things we saw with the How Women Travel study from LA Metro that I can take zero credit for, but it's a great read, um, is that sometimes the, the information that you get from a quantitative source, like a, a survey or um, travel behavior uh, survey data, all of our usual sources, um, it's easier to present graphically in a way that pops off the page and really grabs your attention than something that you get from community feedback. So one of the findings in that How Women Travel study that's kind of buried is um, the nuance in terms of what might make women feel safer on transit. Um, the, the survey results said more police, the community engagement, which is a, a number that you can put on a page and pops out at you. Um, the community engagement results said, well, actually it's more unarmed staff that would help people feel safer, but that doesn't jump out as, as much because it's, um, it's an anecdote or a sentence that comes out in discussion. So I think working on how to blend those types of data to tell a richer story can be important. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to um, the, our next presenter, um, bringing us more into the field of representation. Um, Michelle Bina is a senior analyst, a senior associate um, of CS with over 10 years of professional experience in the areas of travel demand modeling and data and analytics. Uh, Ms. Bina recently returned to Cambridge Systematics after volunteering with the US Peace Corps in Morocco and teaching positions in Vietnam and Myanmar where her focus was on gender equality. It is a result of this work that Ms. Bina has apl applied that gender and diversity lenses to the travel demand modeling and transportation data realm. Uh, CS undertook a full assessment of the firm's diversity, equity, and inclusion practices. She is a co-chair of CS's um, DEI Council, which is now focused on taking results of that assessment and growing the diverse representation of our workforce and promoting an inclusive workplace. Michelle. So um, to start us off, I have a poll. So if you can use your phone or browser uh, on your computer, please go to menti.com um, and type in 969219. And with this poll, I'm asking you um, about, not about how you identify, but um, what you think the diversity makeup is for travel demand modelers. So what share of modelers are men versus women? Uh, don't worry about if your numbers add to 100%, just use your gut reactions. Um, once you fill out the first one, you should automatically go to the next question, which is about race and ethnicity. So good, we got some people taking it. Five, seven, nine, go up pretty quick. I'm gonna give a, a minute here. So again, this is what you think is the representation of travel demand modelers as a complete community. Okay, so about 35. Let's give it a couple more seconds. All right, that's about half the participants. I'm gonna go ahead and show it. Huh? Michelle, you're not currently sharing your screen. What? Oh. Well, that must have been confusing for people. I'll have some technical difficulties. One second. Okay, so it's about 22%. And can you see my screen now? No. No? Michelle, maybe it's on another monitor. So. No, it's not. Now I, now I see it. Okay. Now I see it. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so we see that um, we're, our perceptions are that about 22% of modelers are women. And going to the next slide. About 67% are white, 27% are Asian, seven Latinx, 5% uh, Black African American, and 3% other. So those are interesting. Um, if you are expecting me, and I'll come back to those perceptions in a little bit, but um, 
So if you're expecting me to go to the next slide and I'll show you exactly where we are, I'll tell you that I do not know exactly where we are. Um, I've been looking and I don't have a great answer um, on how diverse we are as modelers or even the transportation industry as a whole. Um, I have not been able to find good data or any really on our workforce. Um, so for this reason, I am presenting information from two different data sources today. One is HR data from Cambridge Systematics. Um, here I have data for any modeler that's been employed at CS since 2005. Um, I'm using this because one, I have access to it. Uh, and two, CS is one of, if not the consulting firm with the most modelers. So I'm hoping that this is a relatively significant sample of modelers in our uh, industry. So recognizing that this data is from one firm, I have some biases. The other data set I have is a TMIT poll that I created a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my concern with this data is that um, it's from self-selection, so we have self-selection bias, and that soliciting the TMIP would result in a higher sample of more senior level modelers in the industry as a whole, because that tends to be who subscribes to the forum. So between, but between these two data sets, I'm hoping to quantify a range of reasonable estimates. So now putting these two data sources next to the diversity makeup of the US population, uh, you can see some clear differences. Uh, with the exception, yeah, so they're relatively similar with the exception of Asian and non-Asian men, uh, but I think we similar enough that we can draw some conclusions. Uh, we are underrepresentative of men or of women, uh, making up for the CS data, it's 38%, the team at poll is 32%. I think it's interesting that our perceptions were 20, what was it, 22%? Um, and then we also are underrepresentative of non-Asian people of color, just 4% of CS modelers and 15% of team modelers compared to 34% of the US population. So why does this matter? Um, as a community specializing in transportation, especially public transportation, we need to be as diverse as the communities we serve. We have different uh, perspectives, which lead to different interpretations and results. Uh, this graphic provides one such example about how two people looking at the same thing can have different reactions based on their backgrounds and lived experiences. There's also this quote from uh, the CEO of Lime, who notes the lack of diversity of their community or of their company that led to a lack of understanding of women. Uh, the Lime CEO also talked about how starting out um, with his early employees being his friends, which led to a lack of that diversity. So people tend to hire and promote people they can relate to uh, most or who would approach a role or assignment in the same way that they would. This is sometimes referred to as affinity bias. So consequences of that affinity bias can lead to the same solutions, to the same problems with the same products. Um, bringing in those different perspectives and giving them voices promote more robust thinking and problem solving. Um, our job as modelers is to understand travel behavior and choices. Uh, how can we understand those without having a workforce that represents that range of lived experiences on and through transportation? So, when confronted with an awareness of lack of diversity, it's often an initial reaction to think that you need to hire more diversely. Um, from my analysis of CS data, that's not necessarily the case. Um, over the last three years, the diversity of our new hires is much more aligned with the US population than our current makeup. And in talking to other women and minorities over the years, the frustrations are with retention. For example, women leaving at the mid-career point, um, and you can see that in this data. So we have two charts here. On the left side is how long modelers have stayed at CS. And on the right is the total years of experience from um, information from the team at full. So these are not comparable. They're not using the same thing, but I think they get to the same conclusion, which is um, in this case, when we're looking at just men versus women, uh, women are much more likely to leave in the first two years and definitely in the last five years. Um, and then in the team at poll, we see 41% of women have just five years of experience or less compared to with just 13% of male respondents. Uh, I don't have race here due to a small sample size, but I have looked at this um, for CS employment data as a whole, and I see the similar retention trends for non-Asian people of color, and even more so for non-Asian women of color. All right. Um, so we have two more charts here that these really show the impacts of those retention rates. So the differences in the makeup of senior or management positions are significant. 
So I don't know exactly why we aren't retaining women and non-Asian people of color, but I do know that we don't see ourselves reflected in the industry leaders. I think that is just further uh, reinforced with the poll at the beginning. So if we're looking at uh, about 20% of women is our perception for um, the industry, that tracks very similar to the left side of each of these charts. So I think it's what we see are mainly the senior and the management people in our industry, and that doesn't necessarily reflect the industry as a whole. Um, and looking at these differences, I think it's also important to think about the economic impacts of this when we start looking at pay equity across different demographic groups. So what are we doing? Um, CS has recognized the importance of having a diverse staff as well as needing to be more equitable and inclusive in the way we work. Uh, this led us to do an assessment in 2009 to see what we were doing well and not doing well um, before coming up with an action plan. So many firms take action thinking they are the right ones. First, we started with a comprehensive data collection effort. That assessment included an all staff survey, focus groups and leadership interviews, conducted by an outside consultant, IBIS Consulting, who assessed CS across a number of dimensions related to our workforce, workplace, and marketplace. Results from the all-staff survey looked for statistical di differences among different groups, such as gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, office location, business line, unit department. Um, and the focus groups provide about those supporting quotes and qualitative data that help explain differences and provide additional information. So here are a few results from that assessment. Um, we consistently saw high shares of employees feeling valued, supported, and enjoyed the work that they were doing at CS. However, there were areas where we definitely saw challenges uh, and disproportionate impacts. Um, for example, a little over half of the staff at, the, at CS thought that we did a good job at recruiting and hiring a diverse workforce. Um, for modeling in particular, we tend to recruit from the same set of schools which have great programs, but are we talking to a diverse set of candidates? if we limit ourselves to these same high-performing schools. So in another example, which was where we saw the biggest differenti differentiator among the different groups of interest was the promotions process. So with the statement that um, the promotions process is fair and equitable, 62% of men agree, only 29% of women agree, and 31% of non-Asian people of color agree with that statement. So it's hard to see that process as fair when the people in the management positions don't look like those that are not. So we created a DEI council. Um, after the assessment, the DEI council developed a strategic plan taking what we learned and recommendations from IBIS and developed actions to better our organization and the work that we do. By laying out the issues and the concerns identified from the assessment, we created four strategic pillars. Um, and we identified the underlying needs for each of them and strategies to address them. So governance and responsibilities specific to the DEI strategic plan were clearly outlined and the council provides a critical role in advising the CEO and setting the direction for the firm. Accountability included transparent DEI metrics along with rewards and consequences. Uh, transparency is a core value in the work that we do at CS and it's important for us that we extend those same values to the strategic plan. Uh, the data that I present today, today are some such metrics that we will be sharing with all of our staff and externally on our website. This is one of our one of the keys to our accountability. So we were not short on ideas for action, um, we, but we needed to prioritize and focus our efforts on establishing those foundational items first. Uh, we wanted the actions to be owned by a variety of staff, not putting it all on uh, HR. So this emphasizes that we all have a role to play and everyone can contribute and help us move towards our goals. So this next slide, which is my last, I could probably talk another 10 minutes about what we can do. Um, so here are just a few small things that you can start doing right now and questions that you can ask yourself about your daily work. Um, and in thinking about things, you can also apply that DEI lens to the work that you do. Um, I hear a lot that we just need more and more data collected but from my perspective, we as modelers have so much data already, but not a lot of that information is being analyzed for equity and it's not being passed up to decision makers. So for a data intensive field where I often hear things like, you can't manage what you can't measure, we know very little about where we stand today as an industry, as a workforce. I presented our CS data today, not because I think that it makes us look good, 
Uh, it doesn't, but it is an important step in recognizing that we know we are not where we want to be. Uh, and I encourage you in this group um, to go to your management, ask them to do an assessment, look at your data, and share your information openly with your peers um, so we can all move forward in making your industry more diverse and equitable. So, um, thank you very much. And any clarifying questions I can help with? Thank you, Michelle. Um, at this point, um, open up for a few minutes of questions. If somebody has a question that they want to ask live, um, please put thumbs up in the in the um, in the participant box, and I can call on you. We have time for probably one or two questions, um, either for, for Michelle or for any of the um, any of the panelists. Um, And I would just want to echo um, um, echo uh, Elizabeth's thanks to you, Michelle, as well. This is not data that um, looks um, that makes CS look uh, great, and I appreciate uh, the president and CEO of, of CS being on this um, in this uh, uh, in this panel as well. And uh, I, th I think it goes without saying that this is reflective of the industry as a whole, and um, that any firm that looked at themselves with this lens would uh, see similar results. Yeah, I, I tried really hard to find comparisons of our industry and I can find things for civil engineering and urban regional planners and but not transportation specifically, but I have no reason to believe that this reflects anything differently than what other modelers are seeing in their organizations as well. And I believe Zephyr is going to be coming out with a workforce survey at some point in the um, near future as well. Um, Elizabeth, do you, um, do you know anything about that that, uh, that you can share? <laughs> I wish I had more up to date since Zephyr is a volunteer driven organization. It's up to the extra time and availability for volunteers to move these things forward. And that's been limited recently. Um, so it's definitely in the works. There's a draft of it. Um, and anybody who wants to help move that forward, uh, please send me a message or send a message to info at zephyrtransport.org. We'd love to have you help. Jonathan, can I just add that um, Michelle's data, I think looking at our public sector and the decision makers, it's probably uh, similar for many agencies out there and even worse at the decision making level. When you look at who's on the board and who are the people being elected, whose voices are being heard. So I think um, it, it's definitely not just reflective of one company, a, a pretty large one, but I think it's reflective of a more systemic thing beyond the private industry. Great, yeah, thanks. I think Mark's question is really relevant, you know. Yeah, I just see that now. So what can be done to attract a more diverse grad student base? Um, so I, I feel like this always comes up kind of after we present this information is that there's, what do we do about the pipeline? There's just not that many, um, a diverse set selective candidates that you have for hiring. I think, sure, that's that's one part of it. Um, we can't wait for that to be fixed because we know we have uh, a lot of problems with our retention rates. And so if, if we can't fix what's going on in our industry now, we can't be receptive to those new incoming graduate students. And we can't, uh, we have to make sure that, I mean, if our retention rates are higher than, or our turnover rates are higher than our hiring rates, it's, it's never going to change, and especially at this executive level. So we need to prepare our workforce and prepare our work environment so that um, we can uh, retain those staff and those recent grads. Are there any um, any other comments? I know that it's 2.30, so I think that um, people may be able to stay for a few more minutes, but I just wanted to um, uh, to wrap um, wrap up and uh, again thank all of the panelists um, for um, for their participation um, on this. This has really been um, been a great a, a great discussion. One thing that we haven't really had a chance to get to that I hope we can stay for a couple more minutes to discuss is what is our agenda um, as a travel modeling community um, in um, in the next couple of months and years to um, promote. 
um, both um, analysis of equity and increasing diversity um, and increasing representation in the field. Um, but I want to just um, start that off by thanking everyone for um, for participating and thanking all of you um, for being here and also to encourage um, people to uh, uh, consider um, the rest of the Zephyr Transport uh, summer and fall learning opportunities, which are listed um, on your screens, as well as considering becoming a member of Zephyr Transport um, itself. Um, at this point, um, if people want to stay for a few more minutes and uh, and uh, have ideas about where we should go from here, uh, I think that would be a great place to uh, a great place to go to at this point. And if people need to leave, that's okay as well. <laughs> Suzanne or Krishnan, do you have any um, thoughts at this point? No, thank you to all the panels and the participants. Very enlightening. No, it's great. Thank you. Um, the one thing I can guarantee is that um, the organizing is that our organizing committee is going to continue to meet and continue um, to work on this issue. If you want to join our small group, please contact um, please contact Suzanne Childress at PSRC or myself, and we'll make sure that we um, get included um, get included in that. Um, I would also point you, and I'll um, in in follow up materials we will send this to um, Suzanne's um, article um, that uh, she published last uh, summer, uh, detailing what the, uh, the real needs are um, in representation in the industry in the industry that we um, need to move forward on I think this has been a great session in in um, in promoting and advancing um, and um, advancing that and of course um, both for presenters on zoom as well as those of you um, who are on the live stream uh, will be um, sending out a summary of uh, comments and um, we'll be keeping this these comments um, and archiving them as well and so if there are um, comments that panelists want a little bit more time to respond to um, we'll make sure that we try to get to as many of those as we can um, so there is one question from Ashley which I think um, so there's one um, there is one question that just came in, um, which is: Are there measures that we use as travel modeling and research community that we take for granted that might actually be harmful to the goals of um, advancing race and gender equity in travel? Um, uh, do any of the panelists want to um, want to address that? Um, I've got one. Um, mode share. <laughs> uh, I, Jonathan, you know this, but I've done some work looking at mode participation as a measure for, for anything where you're not talking about congestion. The, the percent of people who are using a mode at all is a lot higher than the percent of people who are, or the percent of trips being made by a mode. And so we might be able to tap into um, meeting the, the needs of multimodal individuals a bit better if we uh, step back from mode share as the be all end all. I, I also, I concur, and I think VMT is another one. I've always found it very odd that VMT is attributed to the driver, but 80% of the time when a, a couple is in a car together, the man is driving. And so there's a lot of underrepresentation of vehicle travel uh, by women because of VMT. And we tend to think of uh, the car as a single occupant vehicle because of that focus on the work trip, which is the lowest occupancy of the day. And I know safety researchers are much better at this than the travel demand folks. I was also going to say VMT. <laughs> I, I will add for myself um, the um, work traveler um, and the, con the yeah. concept of the commute as being the most important trip that we care about the most and we think is the most valuable. Um, uh, there's um, the assumptions behind that are, are are in many ways very damaging and are really unspoken in a lot of transportation. 
I would add um, travel time reductions. Um, I mean, this depends a lot on where you're starting from in the first place, and in particular for um, low income communities who locate in uh, urban cores. Um, they experience shorter travel times to begin with, and so there's sort of less progress to make, if that makes sense. So I think that we should also be careful with travel time reduction. That's a lot. Yeah, basically all of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Mark Bradley just um, noted the use of income as a key variable, but um, without accounting for all of the attributes that account for um, um, for income differences. Well, and also wealth. As baby boomers, you know, retire, we're talking about people whose income may go down and they report income and that's what we ask about. But in fact, they are operating from um, an area of a lot more wealth than their income represents. Building on the, I had a question, this is Elizabeth Saul. Um, Speaking for myself, not for Zephyr, even though that's what my logo says right now. Um, building on Jonathan, that question about what are detriments, potential detrimental measures, um, I've put it in the chat a few times, but I'm just really curious about what the panelists think about uh, using actualized travel and revealed choices to, uh, that, to drive our planning decisions when in actuality, there's, that doesn't show what the true need is and what the, the risks or the, the consequences are of, of not addressing um, deficiencies and doesn't address, um, you, know, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't address a, a lot of the things that um, might be preventing uh, certain people from traveling. I think that's absolutely there. Um, and um, one of the ways that we're, that we're looking at it is, it's really hard, but looking at disparities in travel can help, um, can lead you to asking questions of why they're there and whether they are essential or whether they exist because of barriers. Um, why is it that people with disabilities travel less um, than abled people? Um, it's, um, it is not because in some cases it's because of employment, but it's not because necessarily of a desire to travel less. Um, why is, um, and why is travel, um, why are certain walk trips not made in areas where it's unsafe to walk, either because of the built environment or because of, um, because of racism? Um, we need to be asking those questions be, and, um, and asking why the disparities exist and not just assume that they're essential differences between people. I think That's my that opinion. That's my opinion. Um, what, I think what might help with that is um, related to something that Jessica offered earlier, which is that, um, you know, methods that combine the qualitative data with, um, with the observed data, I think are really important. Um, in our survey, we actually ask people, you know, are there locations that you struggle to reach? And what are they? Name them. And so we can look at sort of, you know, what the revealed data says about, you know, traveling and looking at other electronic data sources in conjunction, but we can also look at, you know, points where that might conflict with what people are actually saying um, are the, you know, challenging locations. I really like that question, Tira. I wonder how that might fit into our, what we consider the standard you know, current travel analysis and transportation planning framework. One of the things that I've struggled with a lot is people ask, why don't we include income or race or gender in as a variable in disaggregate travel models? And I feel like the outcome of that, if we look at household surveys and do our traditional, um, you know, model estimation 
using those variables is because we can't account for every single reason um, why people of lower incomes might travel less is that it'll just show that they travel less and predict that they travel less in the in the model thereby saying that they don't need as much infrastructure when I think that that's probably not the outcome we want and is certainly not an equitable outcome. I, I wanted to circle back to the idea of how we collect the data. There was a little chat uh, thing about big data and it's just so big that we tend to think it's completely representative, but this is an excellent um, reminder that there is a big group of population that is not included in big data and that's non-travelers. And so we do not know why they're not traveling. We do not know what the latent demand is. We do not know whether they're shut-ins or disabled or people of color. We don't know anything about them. And we also, on the big data side, we don't know the unmet demand in that population as well. But um, I think we're going to have to hang on to our hats for a decade or so because big data is going to crash through us. And unless we continue to keep the focus on who is not being measured, um, it's, it's just going to be the standard input um, into a lot of decision making. So I raise that caution uh, with this group. And we don't know who we, and we don't know anything about the racial or gender breakdown of the big data. We, can, we just, we can assume that it's representative, but we can't disaggregate it because we don't know the gender or the race of the users. And Nancy, you're muted. I wasn't actually saying anything more. I went back to the chat. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, this is that we just have to keep that constantly in mind. And we it will not people will argue, oh, but it's so big, it's got to be representative. But <laughs> um, in fact, it doesn't include non travelers. Yeah, can we capture the chat? It's actually got some terrific. It's, it is being captured, Nancy. It's all being. We, we will be capturing the chat, and I think that I am going to. Um, I think that uh, the post discussion has gone on pretty well, but I think I'm going to, um, in respect of everyone's time, uh, call this to a close and um, thank um, thank everyone again for attending. Thank the panelists again, and. Um, just again, remind us that this is not going to be the last discussion that we have of this type. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we're going to close up. Thank you.